anyway, this is the book that we're going to do. And in it, there's eight biographies. Eight biographies. Really, the last one is not necessarily biographical because it's about this parable of the ten virgins. But there is a lot to be said about it. Don't let it be your biography. Or at least if you do, let it be the wise, the five wise guys. Um, and so this week, we are going to do chapter one. And we're going to do uh, the study of Sarah, the do-it-yourself gal. And so what you're going to do is you're going to read on page nine the chapter regarding Sarah. And really, she goes in quite a bit of depth about it. It's, a, it's an extensive reading and great maps and timelines and things of that nature. So she gives you some academic facts. I feel like I'm talking to Zoom only. Meanwhile, these guys are like, hello, we're over here. <laughs> But then that when you're done reading that, there are four levels of study guide in the back on page 145. Now, of course, if you have a Kindle, this doesn't apply to you. But for those who have the paperback, page 145 then begins the study question for the chapter that you read on page yeah, nine. That's yes, but it won't be on page 145. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, but you're right. Kindle does have the study questions, and it is at the back of the book. But the page numbers are irrelevant for Kindle people. I always just go to the table of contents and click. And there's four levels of homework next week when we meet. Instead of introducing ourselves, we will be discussing the different levels of homework regarding Sarah, the do-it-yourself gal. And there's that small group leader, Sue Bredo, will get to determine what you cover during that time. So where Sue goes, we go. Knowing her, she'll probably have you draw our, our sketch out what the caravan uh, looks like, what the stars of heaven look like. I don't know. But that's how we're going to do this book. And uh, that's all right. So since we're going to talk about the gals, this book really pretty much covers it. Let's me just ask, who are some examples in the Bible of men that had to wait? Who would you say, uh, if I were to say, name some guys in the Bible that had to wait? What names come to mind? David. <laughs> Joseph and David. David had to wait before he was anointed king as a teenager by Samuel, the prophet chosen of God. And he had, and Samuel made a big production of it in front of his family. And kind of like Joseph, he had his brothers ribbing him and like, oh yeah, so you think you're special? You had a dream, they said to Joseph. Oh yeah, you think you're special because Samuel anointed you over us. It was the condition position of David. And so already. Both these boys, Joe and David, have this in common. The brothers didn't necessarily like what they were destined to be. And both of them had to wait a good long time, probably to the mockery of their brothers. You know, like, oh, yeah, so David, oh, oh almighty king. I, well, I'm only going by my own brothers. That's what they would have done. <laughs> oh, Deborah, Deborah, bow down. So you're the king, you know. so. David and Joe both had to go through that. David and Joe, anybody else? Noah. Noah. We thought seven years was long. Joe had to wait 13 years. Noah had to wait a little longer than some of us are ever going to live. 120 years. Preaching righteousness, it says. And it really doesn't seem like anybody paid attention. You know, I, I don't know. I kind of like to imagine that there was a lot of repenting going on as the waters came up. But yeah. however that may be, Noah, I'm sure. And what about Mrs. Noah and her questionable husband? That's a lot of waiting. Jacob had to wait for Rachel. It's usually the girls waiting on the guys to get their act together. But Jacob had to wait for Rachel. Not necessarily because Rachel was slow in getting her act together, but because, well, he had a conniving father-in-law, a Jacob father-in-law. Because Jacob means deceiver. And Laban was a deceiver. Um, deceive, well, it's our tradition here that the firstborn has to be married first. <laughs> Forgot to tell you that part when we read to our labor terms but anyway he had to wait for rachel he ended up getting her seven years in one week but he did have to wait 14 years in order to be done with that contract um job had to wait 
Paul had to wait. You think there, Paul, Paul takes some friends down to Jerusalem that are Gentiles, and it gets all the Jews riled up. Why? Because they did not have the vision of God that all the nations of the earth would join in in the worship of Yahweh. Because these Jews did not have that vision, that they became exclusive in this very inclusive religion of ours, they got quite exclusive and became a click club. They were so upset that they had Paul arrested and thrown into prison. And lo and behold, <clears throat> the Roman authorities like, what? What, are, what is this guy sitting in prison for? I don't know. You know, old Gamaliel said he should be in prison, and we were just like, uh, well, go get him. Let's talk to him. Well, it comes to find out they can't, they can't, they don't have anything on this guy. And they say, well, put him back in, well, actually, Paul, Paul preaches such a good sermon that Festus almost is persuaded. And he says, get rid of this madman before he persuades me to also follow Christ, and I'll lose my position of authority. And so Paul gets thrown back in prison, and he's sitting there drumming his fingers in prison, waiting for the day he gets out. Meanwhile, the king is waiting for a bribe. If Paul would just give me a bribe, I could release him. I'll, I'll, I'll let him be free. But Paul wouldn't do it. Uh, I'd be like, Paul, listen, just think of it as a surcharge. Just think of it as an AT&T fee on your contract for your telephone bill. You know, don't think. Of it. Sometimes I think those are briberies, those things, I tell you. And yet Paul would not take care of that bribe. And so he waited two years in Caesarea by the sea. He got shipped off to Rome, had to wait an additional two years while he was in prison. And this is a go-to guy. This is a man who not was wondering what his purpose was, but knew what his purpose was. It was to plant churches and to spread the gospel to all the Gentiles. He had visions for Spain. I'm going to go to Spain and Portugal. And there he is in prison. And he's waiting. It's easy for me to wait because I'm not a can. I'm a type B kind of gal. I'm not a can-do kind of gal. But Paul, just think of trying to rein that horse in. I, and yet. During that waiting period, when he thought he was not getting anything done, when nothing was being accomplished, he wrote the most glorious of his epistles. The Christological passages that we turn to that describe for us who Jesus Christ is, Philippians. Who was God, emptied himself and became man in the shape of man and, and a slave and died on the cross. And that every, at, at, when Christ, and when God raises them up, that every knee shall bow and every tongue and shall confess that Jesus Christ is Yahweh. He is Yahweh. He's the Lord. And so, and then and he talks about in Colossians that he's the head of church, head of the church. But not only that, he made everything. There is nothing that's made that was not created by him. Everything exists and is held together. The universe, the galaxies. He is that force that holds everything together. And all this is written while Paul is in prison. Here's how my prison epistles would have gone. Like, yo, I don't know what's happening. You know, like, where's my mom? How come they haven't posted bail yet? It's not that much. Aren't I that important to them? You know, I'd be whining about the whole thing. Like, all it's going to take is a call. I'll pay it back, you know. And what? so it's just a vast difference between how I wait and how Paul waited. It was as if God captured him and then the Holy Spirit arrested his heart and said, Paul, we've got work to do. Write out those letters. And he wrote um, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And they're all glorious. Philippians is one of the most joyful um, chapels studying Philippians. Anybody else studying Philippians? I am. It's part of the lectionary. Anyway, my brother's church, Church of the Holy Trinity, is doing Philippians. It's the most joyful book, the least conflict. It's just a glorious book. Um, set your mind on things above. <clears throat> so Paul had to wait. Um, John had to wait. They're on the Isle of Patmos. Christ had to wait. At just the right time, God sent his son. We thought, we think he was too late, but he came at just the right time. I also think of that first Easter, how a lot of people had to do a lot of waiting then too, which is for another lecture. But <clears throat> we're going to talk about Joe. Joseph, that is. There's two kinds of waiting though, really. And we, we think of waiting in two different m mindsets. There is like, yes, um, 
Sunday, NFL starts on TV, and there you are. You're watching the football game, and you've got uh, friends over, uh, social distancing, of course, and you've got soda pop and chocolate milk, and things are going, and uh, your husband comes out because he's the one that does the cooking, and he says, honey, it's going to be a little, it's going to be a few minutes before dinner is ready, and you're like, what? You told me it was going to be at five o'clock, and it's 4.59, and you're saying it's not going to be ready? I thought, no, that's not how you are. You're like, NFL, I got friends, we've got popcorn, we've got all these appetizers. No problem, honey. No problem. You just keep, keep going. So it's just like an incidental waiting. It's insignificant. It doesn't really matter. I don't even know if you can call it waiting. Um, try, try going to the DMV without your iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I'm not waiting in line. I'm not. <laughs> but then there is the critical, the essential waiting, where there you are. You're on, you're on a 23-foot ladder at the peak of a house, putting up Christmas lights, and things are, you know, it's, you're, everything is going in place. And then all of a sudden, you start to feel one foot of the ladder starting to sink into the ground. There's a thawing that has occurred, and the ladder is starting to sink. And you're grabbing on to the shingles there of the roof line, and you cry out, Honey, honey, can you come quick? And, and, she, and he says, uh, Just a few more minutes. I got dinner in the oven. <laughs> it's, like, it's a total different situation and waiting. And we think, um, sure, sure, God, I'm willing to wait so long as I've got uh, friends to hang with, shows to watch, wine to drink, talk, you know, whatever it is. We think, oh, that waiting is not difficult. But when you're hanging on the leg of a, of a pit drop, all of a sudden, and that's how we view all our waiting. Like, like poor Stephanie here, he had to. She had to wait for her oven to preheat tonight. <laughs> I mean, when, the way she told it, my heart was terrorized. <laughs> and so, there, I, I mean, I was picturing her hanging from the leg, her life in danger. <laughs> so that's the way we have a tendency to view it. But just know this. <laughs> just know this, that in, even in our NFL waiting while we got friends, all waiting has purpose and significance. God is in, he takes our time more serious than we take our own time. Um, we think, God, don't you know, if you could just get, if get this boy to, to propose to me, we could move on and have a ministry together. They're like, no, no, not time yet. And I'm sure Joseph felt that way a lot throughout his life. You just think, um, uh, after he was the for a season, maybe for 10 years, the only child of the beloved wife, Rachel. And so he had 10 brothers who knew that he was the only child of the beloved wife. And so you can imagine he had the same issue that David had, mocked, uh, picked on. Jacob might be doing that favoritism thing and, and to try to make up for it. We don't know what the dynamics were, but we know they weren't healthy. And so Jacob was, and he had his mom at least. He had his mom, had his dad, and lo and behold, after um, Joseph was born, Jacob and the family pack up things and they return to Canaan. And, on the, and when they were headed towards Bethlehem, his mother was pregnant and she starts hemorrhaging. And so they stop right there and she goes into labor, and she gives birth to a baby brother for Joseph, but she ends up perishing. She dies, and Joseph becomes motherless. Is it every time he looked at Benjamin, he just like, you killed my mom? Is it every time he looked at Benjamin, who usurped him as the youngest and the pride of his daddy's eye, that he think, did he become one of his brothers? There is no indication whatsoever of that. It's interesting about Joseph that there is no indication of that. He still seems to, he gets the colored coat and all that, but he is motherless. He is hated by his brothers. Hatred probably started early on. He, tell, he tells, he reports, he does what he was, father told him to do. Let me know how the boys are doing. And Joseph comes back and doesn't give a very favorable report. And so 
that does not, that's not good for the PR. That's not a good PR move for Joseph. And um, then he has a dream. And he's got all his brothers, though he never said this. He did not interpret the dream. He just simply reiterated the way the dream went down. And all the boys and the parents recognized what Joseph was saying. They did their own interpretation and they did not like him for it. Are you saying that we're going to bow down to you like these wheat sheaves bowed down? That the stars and the moon bowed down? And just, I'm just telling you what, I, maybe I shouldn't have told you. Don't we just miss that? Like if you don't have it, someone that you can just go and tell everything to. You don't have to worry if it's going to hurt their toes. You don't have to worry if it's going to upset their sensitive feelings. But someone that you can just tell it to, and they're not going to think you egotistical, holier than thou, and they're not going to think you a pervert. You can just tell everything to them. That kind of friend. That's the kind of friend you want to find. Um, and that's the kind of friend that God is. You can't tell him. His shoulders are broad enough. He's not going to think, don't you know the Lutheran doctrine of original sin? Actually, it's not a Lutheran doctrine. It's, a, it's just we emphasize it very well. Oh, I'm going to edit that out, too, in case some Lutheran pastor is watching this. <laughs> I think we're going to have two minutes left of this little lecture here. <laughs> But it's the idea of uh, um, to have that kind of relationship. Well, these brothers were not that close. They, I mean, I, have, I, could, I could tell most of my siblings anything, and they would walk through it with me. But Joseph did not have those siblings, and he took it the wrong way, so he was hated. Then his dad, who didn't have much common sense, it seemed like, this is how I picture it. I'm, I asked myself, what was Jacob thinking to send Joseph to go check on the 10 brothers that didn't like Joseph? Uh, and I think, Jacob, how blind can you be? I'm thinking maybe like this. In order to save face for Jacob, I'm thinking that the boys are out doing the shepherding and they're working and they're trying to find fields for the sheep. And the, Jacob's imagining them being quite hungry, uh, running low on resources and food and water and so he's like joseph i got an idea i'm going to laden you with camels and donkeys full of provisions for your brothers so that when you arrive full of all this glorious food and delicacies they'll think joseph you saved us oh man i remember once i was hiking on mount talic around um, lake tahoe and we had the bright idea a little late in the day, but we went to the top. By the time we were coming down, it was pitch black and we did not have water left and we did not have a flashlight. And we, as soon as Sher my friend Sherry's husband comes up, because we had gotten a little bit of cell signal, um, came up and he meet greeted us with a flashlight and with water. Like, whatever animosity we had about Tony before that <laughs> all disappeared. We think he's the cat's meow, right? And so maybe Jacob was thinking that's how it was going to go down with Joseph. I don't know. I'm just trying to save Jacob's face here because I, otherwise I'm just baffled. But lo and behold, that's what he did. Um, and the brothers see him coming and they're like, we could have all those provisions. But we would have more if we got rid of Joseph. <laughs> like, yeah, because Joseph's a big eater, you know. And they end up throwing him in the pit. So he's motherless. He's hated. He's thrown in the pit. And I suspect being at the bottom of the pit is one of those times he's like, how long, oh Lord, how long before the other boot drops, before the shoe hits, before I am killed? He's like, how many more breaths do I have? He's counting them down. He's asking forgiveness for all his sin. You know how it is? Well, no, we don't. There, I've had a few near-death experiences. I was in the bottom of the Nile once, and I was getting right with God because I didn't think I was going to come back up. I'm like, Lord, the blood of Jesus over everything. <laughs> I was claiming it right then and there. Um, so, and then after the, after he's waiting for death to descend upon him in the pit, lo and behold, Judah says, we're selling you. We're giving you to the Midianites caravan. So he gets lifted up and he's told to the Midianites and he's thinking, how much longer before we get to a destination? How much longer before my dad comes rescue me? He gets to Egypt, and at Egypt, he's put on the slavery box, and they say, how much for this foreigner? How much for this man who doesn't know anything about Egyptian culture, and nobody's bidding? And he's like, how long before someone will buy me? 
How long will I be on this slave block? Finally, someone buys him, Potiphar, and he treats him like a slave. And he's like, how long before he recognizes how hard of a worker I am and he'll promote me? Next thing we read, he is at Potiphar's right hand. Potiphar has trusted him with everything except his wife. And he is trusted and God blesses him. And then uh, Joseph's thinking, he's got a vision board. And on that vision board, he's got the one-year plan, the five-year plan, the 10-year plan. This is where I'm going to be. I'm going to be a millionaire by the time I'm 30. And then when I'm 35, I'm going to be the CEO. He had this vision board. And lo and behold, he's thinking, how long? And the next thing you know, he's falsely accused. Uh, it's interesting. That's in Genesis 37, and it's juxtaposed against Judah. Judah's story, Joseph's story was a man full of integrity that no matter how many times Potiphar's wife asked him, hoping to wear him down, hoping to make him succumb, he kept saying, no, no, no. Uh, man full of integrity, put on his running shoes whenever sin came knocking at his door. Juxtaposed against that, the chapter before is Judah. That Judah, the line from which our Savior comes, we have his exploits. And it's not full of integrity. He ends up sleeping with his daughter-in-law. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought, Alice. Like, <laughs> can you imagine? Uh, and so Judah is juxtaposed with the Joseph story as if to say that is the kind of integrity that Joseph had. And as a result of that integrity, it cost him everything. And into prison he goes. I suspect if he had slept with her, he would have continued in the same prosperous, powerful position. But he still had a heart for the Lord, clearly. And it cost him and he got thrown into prison. <clears throat> Falsely accused, his boss did not trust him. Maybe he didn't have a choice. After all, it was his wife making the accusations. And he was in prison. And it wasn't kind of like a Martha Stewart kind of prison. I'm sure Martha Stewart had a hard time. I'm not saying that. This is the king's prison, but it isn't like the federal prison. There's no appeals. There's no advocate. There's no prison reform. It's called actually a dungeon or a pit. Psalm 105 talks about the bruising on Jake Joseph's ankles, that his, his feet were shackled with iron and he could not move and they were his feet were bruised. <clears throat> so... Uh, he's thrown into prison and he's thinking how oh, much longer do I have to be in prison I know I'm going to work hard and I'm going to become the trustee and he works and he works and he becomes a trustee and he's like how much longer before so this is a guy who's constantly waiting in prison but the part that we're going to look at is Genesis 39 verse 19 We're going to look at Genesis 39, verse 19. This is the part where it probably hurt the most. He's already been in prison for about 10 plus years. I mean, enslaved and in prison for about 10 plus years. This is going on. He's been doing a lot of waiting. He don't even count the waiting before he got thrown into the pit. And then he gets to this point, And I think these two years were probably the hardest years of waiting. It goes like this. Let me get out of the King James and go to something like ESV. As soon as Joseph's master heard the words that his wife spoke about Joseph, that dirty, low down, no good scoundrel. And uh, the wife said, this is what the wife said. This is the way your servant treated me. It's like this foreigner, this is your servant. And that's one thing we want to notice is how often we find in scripture people other people being blamed joseph didn't seem to engage in that but this wife blames his, her husband for bringing this servant down here from israel and look at uh look what he's done to me and potiphar's anger was kindled so joseph's master took him and put him into the prison the place where the king's prisoners were confined and he was there in prison Interesting. Pay attention in these last few verses of 39, how often the Lord shows up. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast, consistent, constant love, something that he hadn't experienced in a long time, and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Ever since his mama died, Joseph hadn't had that experience. <clears throat> 
And so he had favor with the prison warden because of the Lord. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, Joseph was the one who did it. And the keeper of the prison, he was out on a hammock having lemonade. He didn't have to pay attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with Joseph. And whatever Joseph did, the Lord made it succeed. Blessings often come in disguised as hard work. Tough situations are great opportunities. The idea that God was doing something in Joseph's life. He's like, Lord, how much longer? When are you going to, when are you going to get me out of here? And I just, just give me your way, your will. And then the Lord says, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to double your workload at work. And I'm going to take away half of the personnel. And we're not going to give any changes to your pay. That's exactly what happened to Joseph. As far as the prison warden was concerned, he's like, Joseph, I'm going to give you all the jobs I don't like. There's just some jobs I don't care for. And I'm going to give you all the prisoners that I have a tough time with. <clears throat> Joseph's like, I'll take those off your hands. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that. You can trust me. And so it ends up that it says all the prisoners quit to Joseph's care. And all the deeds went to Joseph's care. It wasn't just the latrine. It was everything. And so basically, Joseph is a prison warden without pay. And a smaller man would have done one or two things like, God, I can't believe you did this to me. Or he would have said, I'm going to make sure everybody knows who's in charge. I'm the one with authority here. But not Joseph. He took it all. He was a man who was, um, knew what it was to, to follow. He became a good leader. He knew what it was to be a student, and he became a good teacher. He knew what it was to submit so that he could handle authority fine. There was just something about the training that was going on in Joseph's life during that waiting period. And so he, everything's going his way. <clears throat> and then this is what happens. This is where I think things might have gotten hard for him. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and the baker committed an offense against the Lord, the king of Egypt. <clears throat> we don't know what that offense is. But it is interesting how God has orchestrated this, that these two key officials, these aren't just like uh, servants down in the basement cooking a cake for you, like, like you might see on the help or something. This is where anyone who wants to throw a coup and overthrow Pharaoh, it's not like Hamilton. You don't have someone, Aaron Burr, coming up and challenging you to a duel. No, not to the Pharaoh. You don't run a coup even. Instead, you do it covertly, very secretly, and you put a little poison either in his drink or in his food, and he falls asleep at night, and it's no one's the wiser for it. And so the cupbearer and the baker are key officials. These are men that you trust with your life. Not only do you trust them with your life, you trust them with your secrets. For it's as you're dining, whining and dining, the other political leaders and having these plots and schemes and war, war room discussions that the cupbearer and baker are there making sure everything's being served. So these are key officials <clears throat> that have the ear of the Pharaoh in mind. So they did some offense and Pharaoh was angry with his two key officers and the chief cupbearer and the chief baker and he put them in custody of the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where joseph was confined just an fyi the captain of the guard his name was potiphar so who is potiphar going to entrust these two key officials to it says the captain of the guard appointed joseph to take care of them and to attend to them and they continued for some time in joseph's custody so Potiphar's thinking, these men know the ways of Pharaoh, how to get to Pharaoh. I could put them with somebody I don't trust, and they can create their own coup and create their own strategies and perhaps undermine Pharaoh, you know, have one of those, you say you go into a prison and a saint, you come out a sinner. Just because you learned so much in prison. And Potiphar did not want that to be true for these boys. And so he says, put them under Joseph's care. I trust that man. Maybe he had opportunity to think about it, watch his wife after the accusation and just realize, you know what? I gave Joseph everything. There is not a woman in this kingdom that I could not have gotten for him. I'm not for sure my wife is giving, telling me the up and up on this. 
Maybe he came to his senses, but not enough to release him because after all, he does have to live with a woman. But enough to know if I got two key officials that I don't want creating a coup, I'm going to trust him to Joseph. Joseph will tell me if they started talking that way. So they were in Joseph's custody. <clears throat> and one night, both of them had a dream. The cupbearer and the baker had a dream, each his own dream and each dream with his own interpretation. And when Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. I just want to point out here that Joseph is thinking outside of himself. You know how it is when you got a rock in your shoe and you can't think of anything else but the pain that that rock in your shoe is causing. You'd all time stand still. Everything is about the rock in the shoe. Someone could, you know, say, how's your day? Who asked you? What do you care? You know, like all of a sudden, why are you like that? Because I got a rock in my shoe. And so Joseph had a big rock in his shoe. He's in prison. And yet he's keeping an eye out on other people. He's not thinking of himself. And he realizes something's different about these boys. Uh, what, why are you so sad today? We're in prison, Joseph. We went from vice president of the United States to in prison. What do you mean what's wrong? You know, why would Joseph ask such an obvious question? But Joseph was so in tune. Have you ever had anybody so in tune that something was a little off about you and they come up to you afterwards and say, how's your day going? Is everything all right? And you're like, no, everything is not all right. How did you notice? I don't know, just something. However you want to call it. You want to call it karma. You want to call it aura. You want to, whatever it is, something was not in tune today. And those kind of people to be that in touch are thinking outside of themselves. And so Joseph says, what is it? And he gives them opportunity to speak. You might have some friends that you disagree with or um, are at odds with, maybe politically or whatever. You say, what is it? What is it that concerns you? Why do you do the way you do? And give them opportunity to speak. And so that's what Joseph says. Why are your faces downcast today? <clears throat> and they said to him, we have had dreams and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, bah humbug, dreams. You know where dreams got me? I'll tell you where dreams got me. Right here with you boys. The uh, last time I had a dream, you know. And he could have said, I once was a believer in dreams, but look it. My family was supposed to be bound down to me according to my dreams. Clearly, that's not true. If he hadn't realized he was in a waiting period, he might have said that. If he actually thought this was the final chapter of his life, he might have had a little outburst like that. But it's almost as if jo Joseph recognized this is the not yet. There is more to come. This is not the final chapter. And so he says to the boys, Oh, only God can interpret dreams. He's still a believer in God. He's still saying, he's still recognizing outside of himself, I can't interpret dreams. Maybe I got the interpretation wrong with my own dreams. But he says, do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. Talk to me. Vent. Even if I can't do anything about it, even though I'm acknowledging before you right now, I don't have the answers. I'm not a counselor. I, am, I don't know how to deal with grief. I don't know how to deal with finances. I don't know how to help you in any way, but talk to me, Joseph says. And maybe just in that. So just how often you'll notice when you read through scriptures, how often giving somebody an opportunity to talk ends up proving to be very ministerial. And so the boys start talking. And uh, so the chief cupbearer begins. He tells his dream, and Joseph gives the interpretation. He says, this is what it is. You're going to be restored to the Pharaoh. He's going to lift your head up, and you're going to be restored to your position in three days. And he says, um, he says to them, you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as you formerly did when you were his cupbearer, verse 13, verse 14. Joseph says, only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, so get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also ha I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. Doesn't say anything about Potiphar or his wife, doesn't say anything about his brothers. Matter of fact, he makes it sound like he was stolen instead of sold. So there's no blaming going on. He's not wasting time on that. He's just saying, get me out of this position. 
a lot of commentators kind of tied Joseph at this point for not trusting the Lord, as if to say making plans, setting goals is an indication you're not trusting God. Making action. Uh, we've got a self-confessed do-it-yourselfer in the room here, and as, as if to say that that's a bad thing. We're going to read this week that it is, but sometimes you, we plan our steps, we plan our ways, but the Lord directs our steps. Go ahead and make those plans. Paul said, I am going to Macedonia, but the Lord redirected him, and he ended up going to Philippi and seeing Lydia and the jailer converted. Paul says, I'm going to Spain, and he made those plans. He says to the Roman Christians, hey, plan on hooking up with me. I plan on stopping by on my way to Spain. And lo and behold, God didn't say no to it. He just said it's going to be a different way. You're not going as an explorer and missionary. You're going as a prisoner. So Paul planned, but the Lord directed his steps. And it's the same way with us. It's all right that Joseph asked um, the man, remember me. And it's a simple request. And when you read stories like this, you just want to say, why wouldn't the cupbearer remember him? Why would they? It's like, it's like when Jesus healed the ten lepers, why did the other nine not come? Why was it was only one Samaritan leper who got cleansed that returned and gave thanks to Jesus? Jesus says, we're all the other nine. And someone says, well, one guy was so happy to go see his family. He hopped, skipped, and jumped. He even skipped the priest and went straight to his wife and his little boy. He was so happy. And another guy, he's like, well, you told him to go to the priest. And so he went to the priest, and he did whatever the priest told him to, and he really did what you told him to. You know, like, he was obeying you. Some other guy didn't return thanks because he's like, now what am I going to do? Finally, I was getting good at begging. I, was, I just raked in $200 panhandling, and now he'd take this away from me. The one thing I could do good, and now he's ruined my life. You know, so one guy who didn't return and give thanks because he wasn't thankful. And you could go through all nine guys like that. Why did the cupbearer forget Joseph? Why did he not remember him before Pharaoh? It could be that he's feeling to be in a very precarious situation here. Why, it was just a little while ago, I offended him with something and I got tossed into prison. I don't want to do that again. And so he's walking gingerly around him as I've on eggshells, like, would you like a little wine? You know, bringing his best, the cognac, the, I don't know, his bourbon that was just for his. So he's being very careful, not trying to upset, doing exactly what he's told. And he's like, I can't bring up, I'm not going to say, yo. I got this buddy down in prison, you know, and he's really bright boy. He interpreted a dream for me. I was wondering if you could let him out also. It's, it, it just, he wasn't feeling the safety in that. So to be able to ask ourselves what's going on in his life that that would happen. But for Joseph, I believe this is the longest time of waiting that he had. He, the baker ends up having a dream and he interprets the baker's dream and his head gets lifted up a different way. The cupbearer's head gets lifted up to restore to a position. The baker's head gets lifted up and off uh, being hung. And so it all happened at the Pharaoh's birthday party. Listen, every time you read about a birthday party in the Bible, somebody's losing their head. I'm just saying, be careful whose birthday party you go to. Um, so in verse 21, Pharaoh restored the chief cupbearer to his position, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed a dream as he was standing near the dial. And interestingly, Pharaoh had to bring all the magicians and all the wise men do all that productivity before the cupbearer even dared make a squeak. Like, should I tell him or should I not tell him? Oh, what should I do? Have you ever been in that, those throws? Like, is this going to be enabling or is this going to be tough love? What should I say? Yes. Should I say no? And he's going through this throes of indecision after all the magicians, after all the wise men go through and they can't tell. And Pharaoh's even telling them what he dreamed. This is easier than what Daniel had to deal with. And so, Nobody could do it. And so Pharaoh is frustrated, like, this is what I pay you guys for? I've got you on the cabinet, and this is it? 
You guys are a bunch of losers. Do you know how much taxes I tax people so that you can get your paychecks? And you, what do you guys do with your time? Who, where did you even come from? You know, he's in a frustration. He's in upheaval. He's had to stream and he's all frustrated that nobody's proven productive. And the cupbearer is like, <clears throat> excuse me, sir. I don't know how he went about it, but he's, he taps him on the shoulder. And he's like, uh, the way he says it is quite sweet, actually. Um, talks about attractive cows. I've really never, ever talked about cows in terms of attractiveness before, but this guy does. I don't know. In the ESV. Okay, this is what he says in um, verse 9. The cupbearer, the chief cupbearer says to Pharaoh, uh, I, I just remembered my offense. I'm sorry I didn't say this sooner. I'm sorry you paid for everybody's flight here and everybody's ticket to get here and their accommodations, but I just now remembered my offense today. And when Pharaoh was angry with his servant, he's talking about himself in the third person there for a little bit before he goes to first. And he's like, uh, when Pharaoh was angry with his servant and um, that was me and put me and the chief baker in the custody of the house of the captain of the guard, well, we had a dream on the same night, both the baker and I, and we had each had its own interpretation in that there was a young Hebrew that was with us. Why did they even know he was Hebrew? Is it because the shape of his nose? Is it because of the tone of his skin? Or is it because Joseph was quite vocal in how he, when he was asked to interpret, he said, only God can interpret, only Yahweh. So it could be that he had that reputation. And, but when we told him the dream, he interpreted the dream for us. He gave the interpretation to each man. And as he interpreted it, so it came about. I was restored to my office and you um, did the right thing. Uh, yeah, you executed justice on that baker. <laughs> he wasn't going to be, but he said the baker was hung. And then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And this is like the dog that you find at the construction site that's emaciated and he's maimed and he's, and he's got disheveled. And so they said, Joseph, you got to clean yourself up. And they start working with his hair. It's hopeless, they say. Just shave the guy. And so they shave his head, give him a change of clothes, and he comes in quickly before Pharaoh. And he ends up giving Pharaoh the interpretation. Pharaoh has these attractive cows, seven years of plenty, and then he has these seven, then he has skinny cows that eat up the plump cows. That's seven years of famine. Pharaoh asks for an interpretation. But Joseph goes a step further in verse 33, and he says, Let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land. So he ends up giving them a strategy, a plan. Did God tell him ahead of time what this dream was? Is this something that God just gave them to there on the spot? Have you ever been visiting with someone and, and they're in the throes of despair and they're going through a crisis and you say something and you're like, man, where'd that wisdom come from? I don't even practice that in my own life. How, where'd that? And it's like, that's exactly what Joseph must have been experiencing at that point. And this proposal pleased Pharaoh and he says to everybody, his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? If the cupbearer had remembered two years earlier, Joseph would have been released into the masses. No good reason, you know, to keep him on cabinet. He's a prisoner. Just get rid of him. Free up the space in prison. COVID might reach him. Get him out. And so they do that. Joseph would have been lost. And the cupbearer would have remembered two years later after Pharaoh had a dream. Well, there was a guy, but we released him. And we don't know where he's at anymore. But instead... It was as if God said, I'm keeping him here. Like the back of the book says, it could be that the waiting room is God's classroom for training. Joseph went from a little boy, from a little family, in a little town, on a little outpost of the little uh, land of Cana. And as he was going through this 13 years of waiting, of all different scenarios of waiting, he was being groomed to become the most powerful man of the most powerful nation of the whole world. And it all happened in what we would have thought wasted time. Nothing's getting done. It's all worth, it's not happening. But God uh, was grooming him, was training him. 
those two years, Joseph had to say, how am I going to deal with being forgotten? Joseph's like, man, we were friends. We, we, I, I, I could read you. I could finish your sentences. There were things you were saying. I'm like, yeah, I already know. I think that's a good idea. I, we didn't even, we could communicate. You ever had someone like that where you just knew their thoughts? You could think it. You could think it. You didn't even have to talk it. And lo and behold, you're on the same page. And Joseph thought he was that way with the boys. That's why sometimes he had to ask them, hey, what's wrong? There's something I'm not reading right about you. And then he says, remember me. And he doesn't get remembered. He gets slighted. And he becomes bitter. No, he doesn't become bitter. And he, and he, and he becomes like, that's it. Teach me to do any good thing to people. That's what, that's what you get when you help someone. You don't get any good returns. I'm just not going to do it anymore. You ever met anyone like that? Have you ever behaved that way? Teach me to do good by anybody. It's just a waste of time and a waste of resources. Why? Well, I could have fed that to my dogs. He would have enjoyed that more. You know, he would have thanked me more. But Joseph wasn't that way. So he, he recognized, he seemed to recognize because he was growing in favor with everything that he did. Pain does have a way of elongating time. So I'm sure it felt like more than two years to Joseph. And I'm sure the temptation came often that he ought to think negatively about his friend, the cupbearer. When we think about waiting, there are just a few things I want to just mention. Um, thinking about others can help us in the wait. When we're waiting for something, oftentimes we want to isolate. We want to just, um, especially introverts might have a real problem with this idea of just being alone and just me and God. That's all I need. I don't need church. I don't need this fellowship business. It's all hard work anyway. And if you knew the saints that I had to hang with, you would want to isolate too. So we could come up with all kinds of excuses. But in relate, the relationship with others helps us in the waiting. That's why God gave us each other. Two is better than one. Three is even more. Give me a community and then I might have a chance. When I'm feeling hopeless, I can borrow yours. When I'm without faith, I need my, when I'm a paralytic, I need four friends who will carry me to Jesus kind of a thing. And so there it is. The first thing when we're trying to deal with waiting in relationship to others is resist the temptation to blame others. Joseph did not, when he was restored, he didn't say, first thing you need to do is get rid of that cupbearer. No, he must have talked to Joseph. He must, Joseph must have talked to him and say, how did it go down? How did it happen? And when did you, when did you realize it to, to remember me? And then the cupbearer must have told Joseph, this is how it went down. You should have seen him parade all the magicians and all those wise men. They were looking pretty dull then. And so he, he must have talked to him in a friendship, that kind of way. But he resisted that. And sometimes we need to resist that. When we're going through a hard time, you see it in culture today, somebody has got to be blamed. When I lived in Zambia, every death had someone that had to be blamed. And there were some that were natural deaths. There were some that were accidents. Who's to blame? I had an 11th grader, Godfrey. He was uh, crossing the river to go get a new boat. He was in a dugout canoe. And really, I think really the rower of the boat was intoxicated, but the boat got tipped over. The rower got saved, but Godfrey went down. And they never found his body they think it went into a crocodile cave and so they asked themselves who's responsible for this death everybody's looking for someone to blame and I would blame the rower but no they're just looking for who can we blame who can we blame well there's this new guy that's moved into the village who's still in really pretty material he's the one to blame he is thriving he's having a good he's taking over my business so they just pick him arbitrarily other times they would pick the grandmas you know she's really getting becoming a real burden let's just say it was her fault so it didn't matter die of a heart attack someone is to blame well we think oh we're much more sophisticated than that we would never engage in such dalliance like that you know no no but you know what we do we find someone to blame anyway there are those veterans, uh, fishermen out on the Sea of Galilee, and the winds start kicking up, and the waves start splashing against their boat, that even these sailors of men who grew up on the sea are fearful for their life, and they start bickering with themselves, with each other, like, this is your fault, Andrew, why did you make us, I didn't keep the time schedule, you're the one that wanted to go, you know, I mean, have you ever heard it? And instead, after every, they've accused all 12 of them, they turn to Jesus and say, 
It's your fault because you don't care. You don't care. Go to Jesus and accuse him. Blame him. Lazarus dies. And Martha and Mary both say in agreement, if you were here, this never would have happened. You're just looking for someone to blame. Why should we blame them? Because we do the same exact thing. Joseph refused and he resisted to blame others. Even, even Potiphar's wife, remember, she said, this servant that you got me. Listen, man, if I just had a servant, I don't care <laughs> what, just someone to do anyway. Also, the healing power of compassion. Resist blaming others. Don't be looking around, who's to blame for this? Well, this is my husband's fault, or this is my kid's fault, or this is my dog's fault. Unless it's Henry. Nobody would blame Henry. Um, resist blaming others and the po healing power of compassion. And I don't just mean God's healing power towards us, because indeed that is very healing. His compassion towards us. Your compassion towards me is very healing. But it, for Joseph, like I said, it was healing for him to be thinking of others, to be thinking outside of himself, get a job to do. He got down to business. Yes, his workload increased, but he stayed with it. And it actually was helpful part of his healing. And he cared for others. When they told him his, their woes, and he's like, you think you got it tough? All you got to do is do exactly what I say. I've got to manage the whole system. If you only knew how tough I had it. And you guys going on and whining. He didn't do that. He had others' well-being in mind. The importance of listening. He asked them a question. Let them answer. Let's be good listeners. Especially pre-election. 2020. Be good listeners. And he was thinking outside himself. He was thinking outside his present situation. If I'm in prison, I'm thinking... It'd be like Eeyore, don't bother, I'll be here for life. Just make sure you get me some cardboard to eat. You know, but Joseph's already, he's got a new vision board in his prison cell. In five years, I'm going to be out of here, and then this is going to happen. And he's thinking outside, of because he says to the cupbearer, listen, when you get a chance, remember me when you restored to Pharaoh so that you can get me out of here. Dare to think about the future, folks. Think about, envision it, dare to dream. Well, dreaming only gets you disappointed. Put it in the hands of God and say, Lord, I am doing this because you gave me an imagination. Sanctify my imagination so that I can dream your dreams, have your vision. I'm sure it didn't work the way Joseph had it on his vision board, but he did not keep his focus on the present. Now, when you're with your friends, by all means, be, live in the present, but dream and scheme for the future, especially if you're in a dire situation. Thinking outside himself, thinking outside his present situation, picturing himself there hanging out with Pharaoh, and he's picturing himself, he's thinking of him outside of his abilities. He's not saying, I can interpret your dreams, because he knows he can't. He's saying, God is the interpreter of dreams. Ah, uh, dreams failed me, and I don't picture how this dream is going to be fulfilled, but I know that still this remains. God is the interpreter of dreams. Know this. The fruit is worth the wait. It says of him that the proposal pleased Pharaoh, since God has shown you all this, there's none so discerning as wise, so you shall be over my house and over all my people, and they shall do themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne, I'm the only one who will be greater than you. Everything else will be according to how you decide. And that's the way it went down. He had to wait 13 years for God to bring that to fruition. And it's because he never lost sight in, in God himself. You know how many people give up on God because like, well, if God was good, I'd never be in prison like this. Joseph did not give up in waiting. It, so just know this, there's purpose and significance, there's training going on, waiting is never wasted, and the fruit will be worth the wait.